Hi, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whichever it is. Um, this is your chapter on nutritional and metabolic diseases. And um, so a few concepts of health and disease. So um, the World Health Organization um, defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and uh, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So basically what it means is um, health has is more than just a physical aspect of, um, you know, not not being sick, but it's even beyond that. It's also actually feeling good and it's feeling good physically, but also mentally and then having good um, social relationships and, and stuff. So uh, things that can uh, affect health and disease, um, the environment is definitely one so um, pollution, if you live in, especially like in big cities where there's a lot of cars and there's a lot of pollution, just think of like the smog over LA and stuff like that, that can affect your health uh, because you're breathing in chemicals and, and stuff that um, become part of your body and your cells and it can affect cellular function. Um, radiation, depending on, you know, there's certain area where radiation is higher or like radiation near like towers and uh, electricity and stuff like that, um, electric stations and stuff. Um, weather can affect it in different ways. Um, you can think of extremes of weather or you can think of uh, weather phenomenons like tornadoes and hurricanes and stuff like that. And then you can think of um, just simply the type of weather, you know, where you live um, might um, like just think of all the tropical diseases. But in a way, those are all weather related. Um, they're tropical diseases because um, the air the weather in the area is hot and humid and it favors the growth of, you know, um, the host for the pathogens and stuff. Anyway, um, there are physical th uh, threats to health. We're going to uh, co cover some of those here in a minute, uh, cold and heat. And uh, we're going to look at the role of nutrition. So uh, don't underestimate the role of nutrition. Um, it is quite amazing what can be done with a good, healthy diet and or targeted diet for um, certain diseases and especially chronic diseases. So some of the stuff I can think of is um, autoimmune diseases and um, uh, diabetes, you know, especially well, type two diabetes and ones that are lifestyle driven. Um, there's a lot of ways you can actually reverse or really, really um, manage well these types of diseases um, with nutrition and it's actually more powerful than even drugs. And then lastly, we'll cover the inborn errors of metabolism. All right, so let's start with cold injuries. So um, it's um, a body temperature below 37 Celsius um, or um, body tissues that freeze. Now, if your body temperature drops below 32 Celsius, you will actually um, pass out and um, go unconscious and you, your heart can stop too. Um, and so if you think of just body tissue freezes, you would be thinking of um, things like uh, frostbite and frost nip where um, maybe fingertips are fro frozen, uh, tip of the nose or ears or something like that. Um, susceptibilities, obviously, uh, any exposure to sub-zero temperatures or you know, sub-freezing temperatures. Uh, so if you live in areas that get really, really cold and you... Um, it gets stuck outside for extended amount of, amounts of time um, that, you know, puts you more susceptible to cold injuries. Um, hypothermia does slow body functions. Um, so um, if, you know, it drops your temperature, but not 100 percent, like there's still ways that you can recover. Uh, but everything, you know, everything kind of goes in suspension and slows. Um, it is such actually that um, to pronounce somebody dead that's like super cold like that, they actually have to warm them back up to make sure that they are truly dead, which is really interesting. Anyway, um, potassium levels will co correlate with recovery and cold injuries. So um, if their serum potassium level is uh, really high, their chances of recovery are low. And I'm, we're talking about like more than 10, which is more than double the upper limit of normal. The reason is, um, as you remember, potassium is an intracellular ion. Um, and as um, cells freeze, uh, you know, the water <coughs> crystallizes in there and breaks the cells and releases the cellular contents. And so um, that, you know, causes potassium to be spilled out and uh, a climb in potassium. And so the higher the potassium is, the less likely the person is to recover. 
Um, so it is worth noting that you have to interpret some results with caution. So um, the body temperature of the person is below 37, but all the tests are performed at 37. So it, it can actually falsely increase certain values, especially on the ABGs. Now, um, for the chemistry test, you don't have a choice. I mean, the, the stuff is tested at 37. That's what the analyzer has said. There is a way in uh, certain ABG analyzers to enter the person's uh, body temperature if it is higher or lower than normal, uh, and the, um, the machine can calculate compensation for it and stuff. So um, that is an option. And uh, hematology and hematocrit may be falsely high due to smaller plasma volume. Um, frost nip and frost bite. Uh, so frost nip turns the fingers white and is the beginning of freezing. Frost bite, the tissue is frozen and the blood supply is cut off. Both of those are actually clinical diagnose, uh, diagnoses. Um, the lab doesn't really assist in that. But um, let's say somebody is brought in with frostbite and that tissue froze and the blood supply was cut off and they'll, it's very possible for them to set up gangrene. They can set up infections and stuff like that. And then of course, if that's the case, then the lab would come in um, with you know monitoring with blood counts and cultures and stuff like that. So now let's switch to heat, uh, the heat illnesses. So um, heat cramp is the mildest form, um, and it's usually due to salt and water loss. So you can get heat cramps if you sweat a lot. Uh, so again, you get cramps in your muscles, and it's because you are sweating out your uh, electrolytes, and uh, you need to replenish them, and you're sweating. You're losing more than you can replenish. So um, if you start cramping uh, when you're outdoors and stuff, that's a sign that your body's giving you that you need to replenish your um, salt and water, both. Um, and that can be, um, there's so many ways that, that can do. That's uh, part of the point behind the drinks like Gatorade um, and Powerade. Um, but you can, um, you can drink pickle juice, uh, coconut water, and, uh, or eat something salty, but then drink a lot of water. So just know that you need some salt and some water. And you can actually, really, if you don't even have any of that stuff, you can sprinkle some salt in your water. Now, you don't want to make it so salty that you can't drink it, obviously, but um, just, you know, a sprinkle of salt in your water uh, can help also replenish that. Now, heat exhaustion is uh, more, obviously, than heat cramps, so it's the next step up. So um, the symptoms can resemble hypoglycemia or coronary issues, so you should um, always do um, glucose and uh, troponins and stuff to confirm. And this would be to confirm that it's not hypoglycemia or that it's not a coronary issue, so you, you've got to test those. Uh, obviously, we test some electrolytes and all of that, too. Um, so, um, the biggest thing that you're looking for is you, you don't want to, you, you're looking, they're probably going to have some level of hyponatremia, so some, some lower than normal sodium levels. You just want to make sure that they're not extremely low. Um, the symptoms, uh, with heat exhaustion is, um, they will be pale, but they still have a moist skin. Uh, they will have fever, so their body temperature is higher than normal, nausea, vomiting, uh, diarrhea, headache, and fatigue. So, um, again, uh, and at this point in time, they're, they're still, they're pale, but they're still sweating, but their, their body's hot, um, they have a headache, they don't feel good, and all of that. So those are all signs of heat exhaustion, which can happen even just with um, kids playing outside. They don't, you know, realize that they were getting too hot and stuff, and they don't stop and rehydrate um, enough adequately and stuff. And then the next one is heat stroke. So heat stroke is a medical emergency. Heat stroke can kill you. So um, if you don't um, catch it during heat exhaustion, you can progress to heat stroke. Um, and the heat gain overwhelms the ability to lose the heat. Uh, and um, the body temperatures are going to be you know, above 41 Celsius, but they're saying like it can be a high, as high as 106 to 110 Fahrenheit. So that means like can basically can fry your brain. You'll have tachycardia, hyperventilation, they can have GI bleeds, liver injury, rhabdomyolysis, kidney injury, and cardiovascular collapse. So, I mean, it can lead to death. This is, you know, you can have multi-system organ uh, failure. Now, heat stroke can be ex exertional or non-exertional. So that, um, for example, an example of heat stroke that's exertional, think of soldiers that are um, in full uniform with backpacking gear on and all that, and they're 
doing hikes or maybe they're on deployment out in the desert or, um, you know, training or something like that. And it's really hot. And so their clothing is keeping them from being able to lose all that heat. Plus they're, they're um, generating heat through their activity and stuff and a combination of that and then not being able to hydrate enough. Even if they are hydrating, it's possible that the, the imbalance can cause a uh, heat stroke. Uh, non-exertional would then be simply um, heat stroke from, from exposure to too much heat, but you're not engaged in any kind of exercise activity or, um, you know, even, and I'm talking about exercise, it can just, you know, act, let's just say activity and stuff like that. So, um, and the lab results on a heat stroke, you can see metabolic acidosis and possibly also respiratory alkalosis because of the hyperventilation. Um, and the electrolytes, uh, you'll see actually uh, severe dehydration with the, the high sodium and the low potassium. Um, and then a lot of the enzymes can be elevated because you can see the liver injury, rhabdomyolysis and all that kind of stuff. So you would expect, you know, elevated liver enzymes, elevated CK. Um, so yeah, their lab are going to be all kinds of out of whack on a heat stroke. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about nutrition. Um, so um, in general, nutrition is the proce process of utilizing food for health and growth. So uh, we have to eat, we have to eat on a regular basis to maintain our body. And then of course, when we're growing, when we're kids, we need uh, food and nutrients to grow. Um, and uh, even though um, as adults, we're not technically growing anymore, we are in a way growing because we are regrowing things. We are replacing linings. We are doing you know, things that are maintenance uh, in our body. And, uh, and then if you have any kind of um, injury, illness, um, you have an increased need. Uh, let's say you're having to repair a uh, broken bone or something like that, you would have an increased need. Um, so the government has put out some recommended daily allowances. Now, that's usually uh, with the advice of nutritionists and stuff like that. And uh, one thing you have to remember is kind of like that's what they consider the minimum, including for the vitamins and all that. And sometimes um, a person may need more than a minimum. Um, so, um, I think nutrition is something that has to be really targeted to the individual. And um, there are ways to test and to target uh, interventions and supplements and stuff to the needs of the individual. There used to be a food um, pyramid, and uh, now they've come out with the My Plate. Um, and so if you notice, about half of the plate should be fruits and vegetables here on fruits and vegetables. And then they have grains, dairy, and protein. And again, that's the, you know, the government, one of the government's way to, to just kind of make it easier for the common people to, to see that. Of course, you know, dairy is actually not specifically necessary. There are people like me that I can't do dairy. Dairy makes me sick. Actually taking dairy would be worse for me than not. Um, I'm also sensitive to grains, so this portion here is almost non-existent. I eat pretty much protein, vegetables, and fruit, and nuts and seeds. Um, so again, it's just kind of like broad guidelines. Um, obviously, excess weight can negatively affect health, and uh, obesity is a, a an excess weight weight is a risk factor in so many chronic diseases, um, and it's really um, been a plague to the healthcare system in the U.S. Um, because so many uh, adults are obese. Uh, so it is at an all-time high in the U.S. It is definitely related to diet and lifestyle. Part of the problem, um, I personally think, in the U.S. is um, the amount of processed foods and the amount of highly palatable foods. So basically, um, one way to say it is foods are made to be addic addictive and um, they are designed to, to trigger that in you so that you, you develop in a way brain loyalty and that you, um, are become a lifetime consumer and that, you know, that make sure that they have the, the revenue. Um, and so, um, if you think about it, you know, you can easily be addicted to things like Oreo cookies, but who's going to be addicted to broccoli. Right. And so, um, one way to eat is simply eat things that are um, that don't have labels and stuff. So, you know, I'm talking about um, a banana doesn't have a nutritional label. Um, an apple, some, you know, some kale, I guess, or some spinach or some lettuce and all of that. Um, 
And I, and if you buy stuff, because I'm mean, of course we are going to buy stuff that's in boxes and that's pro, you know somewhat processed, uh, just keep it to a minimum list of ingredients, uh, and there should be ingredients that you recognize and can pronounce. And that if you can just do that and eat lots of fruits and vegetables and a good amount of protein, you can already do better than the majority of people in the U.S. Um, and then lifestyle is related to how you manage your stress and you know how active you are and and stuff. Okay, so uh, the hormonal effects of food are, um, this is definitely something worth touching and talking about. So uh, hormones help regulate digestion and absorption, uh, and they're involved in the entire process. So you have your digestive hormones that like uh, gastrin and cholecystokine and the secretin and stuff like that. Uh, if you need to, you can go back into the uh, GI chapter and go back and review some of those. Some of them uh, that we may not have mentioned in that chapter, I don't think we did, uh, are ghrelin and leptin. And those are two really, really interesting. So ghrelin is your hunger hormone, and it has to be turned off for you to not be hungry. Uh, and this is interesting. One of the things that does turn that uh, hormone off are proteins and fats, uh, but carbs do not. So that that's why if you eat something that's uh, more carby, so let's say like maybe some potato chips or uh, cookies and stuff like that, it's, e it's easy to, to just keep eating and keep eating and keep eating because uh, carbs don't turn hunger off. Uh, but if you eat, um, you know, a big old steak or something like that, like it's really hard to overeat meat um, and stuff. Uh, so something that has a high protein or fat content. Uh, and then leptin is a very interesting one. Um, so leptin is a molecule that's produced by your fat cells. Uh, it's a hormone and it signals to your brain how much energy you have stored and how much you are able to get rid of. Okay, so it's a inventory, if you will, of how much uh, fat you have on your body. Uh, and what can happen is if you have an abundance of, if, let's say you have a lot of fat in your body, so you produce a lot of lap, leptin because you have a lot of fat cells, you can develop leptin resistance. Same, very similar as insulin resistance. Um, so in insulin resistance, there's an overabundance of insulin and the receptors aren't, you know, it's not binding to the receptor, so it's not having the effect, it's not sending the signal that it needs to send. With, with leptin, it's the same thing, so it's not binding to those receptors in the brain and stuff, so it's not sending the signal, and there's an overabundance of it, so you have leptin resistance. So basically, the way that translates is you could be 100 pounds overweight, and if you have leptin resistance, your body thinks that you're starving. It thinks that you are a toothpick, that you have zero fat reserves, and that you need to eat some more. And so it can drive hunger and can drive eating habits and stuff like that. How do you reset leptin resistance? Uh, one of the ways is fasting. Um, and probably the most approachable way to fast is maybe doing intermittent fasting where um, you don't eat for at least, I would say, 14 hours is probably going to be the, the, the a good average if you're a guy you can probably go 16 hours and the best way to do that is for example to um let's say you eat supper at like 6 p.m then you don't eat anything again until 8 a.m that's 14 hours overnight you know uh, so it's pretty easy to do and do that on a regular basis and that can help start resetting uh, leptin sensitivity uh insulin We've already covered in the pancreas chapter, but uh, it lowers blood glucose. So it's uh, released after a meal when your blood glucose levels go up to uh, get those that glucose into the cells and to be utilized and stuff. Uh, and then glucagon raises blood glucose. So that glucagon is a hormone. Uh, both are secreted by the pancreatic cells, but they're not. They're, they're hormones, not digestive enzymes. Okay. So... Um, they uh, glucagon raises blood gl glucose when you are fasting. So when you're fasting and you have not eaten in an extended amount of time, you need to maintain your blood glucose. And so glucagon will allow that and allow the glycogen to be broken down and uh, even gluconeogenesis to happen where you can build glucose from like protein and stuff. Um, your macronutrients, macro as in big, are required in large amounts by the body, and those would be your carbs, proteins, and fats, so the main components of your nutritional label. Uh, the 
way my doc, uh, she wants me to eat, um, and I think it's a pretty good way. So every, every, every meal, every time I eat, I have to have a mix of carb proteins and fats. And uh, I can't eat just carbs. She'll fuss at me if I eat just carbs. Um, and um, she says a good, um, if you look at your grams of carbs, um, this should uh, be equivalent to your grams of protein. So that's one way she's uh, told me to, it's pretty easy to kind of manage and um, look at. Okay, so let's um, dive into the carbohydrate. The first is the macronutrient. Um, so uh, carbohydrates can be classified as uh, monosaccharides, disaccharides, oligosaccharides, and polysaccharides. So your monosaccharides are like your glucose and fructose and stuff. Um, your disaccharides are like sucrose, um, and um, your oligosaccharides are small, smaller sugars. They're bigger than disaccharides, and then the polysaccharides are your big ones, like your your starches and uh, glycogen and stuff. Um, and so um, your carbohydrates are all broken down into glucose or fuel. Glucose and or some, some fructose, but um, the um, liver is the only organ that can ac actually use fr fructose uh, and deal with it. Everything else has to have glucose. Um, so it, one way to look at it is like everything that's represented in um, this picture here, whether it's um, pasta, bread, rice, crackers, uh, you know, any of these things, uh, even cookies and stuff like that. Um, anything that is a carb, basically from your neck down, your body sees it as sugar because that's what it becomes. Okay. I mean, I know they all taste different, but ultimately to your body, they're sugar is what they are. Um, so again, insulin, uh, is a storage hormone It's triggered by the presence of glucose so that you can store up that glucose in the cells and in the liver. Uh, and, but insulin, uh, is also released if you eat excessive calories or excessive amino acids, which are protein. So that's interesting. So excess protein consumption, excess calorie consumption, and ex and, and then just simply carb consumption all trigger the release of insulin. Uh, and then any kind of excess carbohydrates, uh, that are beyond what you can use, um, insulin will drive the carbohydrates to be just stored as fat. So uh, your body sees all of that as potential energy, so it doesn't want to get rid of it. So it's going to store it in its storage form, which is fat. All right. Glucagon uh, is, again, a mobilization hormone, so it can mo mobilize uh, glucose uh, into the bloodstream. Um, and it can release uh, stored glycogen and fats and uh, make, you know, make them into usable energy. So obviously glycogen is cleaved into glucose. Uh, fat into fatty acids that can be burned. Um, and glucagon can be stimulated by the presence of protein also. So. Right. And it's remember, it's the hormone that's released during fasting. Okay. So let's talk proteins. So uh, proteins are ultimately broken down into amino acids. And then you use your amino acids to build the proteins that you need for your body. So to build your antibodies, to build uh, your albumin, to build all your transport proteins, plus the proteins that are receptors in your cells and just in so many places. Um, plus, you know, you need it to maintain muscle, all of that. Um, it is interesting to note the body cannot store protein. So you need daily intake of protein. It does not have a storage system for excess uh, protein or excess amino acids. So they are all processed. They're used or discarded. Uh, essential amino acids have to be ingested. There are 20 amino acids total. 10 of those are essential. That's kind of, uh, they're, they can say a little, sometimes there's a little bit more than that, but just if you can remember 20 amino acids uh, total and 10 of them are essential, you're good to go. Um, additional protein is required uh, during any kind of growth or rebuilding process. So, and if you're sick to build antibodies. Uh, and so like if you were injured, uh, you're recovering um, from, you know, maybe a car wreck or something like that, you need extra protein to rebuild. Uh, uh, the only two scenarios you would want to restrict protein are acute liver failure because your uh, liver can't process those proteins, uh, so it can be damaging, and end-stage renal uh, disease also because it can't get rid of them and stuff. And so uh, those are the two, only two reasons you would want to uh, restrict protein. All right, and then our fats. So um, our dietary fat brings uh, in cholesterol, triglycerides, and fatty acids uh, into our bodies so that we can use it. 
Um, again, we had a whole chapter on, on fats and lipids and stuff, so you can go back and review that. Um, but, you know, cholesterol is a building block for a lot of hormones, such as cortisol and testosterone and estrogen and progesterone and all kinds of stuff like that. Triglycerides are, you know, energy, stored energy, potential energy. They're also needed to make, uh, you know, phospholipids and stuff like that. And your fatty acids are also needed for, um, a bunch of stuff, but phospholipids is definitely a big one, which are used for your cell membranes. Your uh, essential fatty acids are uh, omega-6 and omega-3s. Uh, omega-6 are linoleic acid and omega-3 are um, lin linolenic acids, so linoleic and linolenic um, fatty acids. Um, and the 3 and the 6 designation has to do with the placement of the double bond in this unsaturated, unsaturated fatty acid. Um, so as a general rule, our, our diet tends to have, if you, if you follow a standard American diet has too much omega six in relationship to omega three. So we need some omega six, but too much then becomes inflammatory. Omega threes are more anti-inflammatory and we need more of them. Uh, Omega-3s can be found in uh, fish, fatty fishes. Uh, you can take a supplement, which often is made uh, from fish oil or krill oil. Um, and so we need we need a good intake of good omega-3s and try to limit omega-6s. Your And your omega-6 can be like in um, corn oil and vegetable oils and things like that, which are man-made oils, which aren't good for you. Your uh, eicosanoids... Um, they control the production of hormones and physiologic functions, so they're really important. They have a profound effect at very dilute concentrations. Uh, example of, of some of your eicosanoids, which are all made from fat, are your prostaglandins, thromboxanes, lipotrines, and lipoxins. Uh, and again, the, the omega-6, omega-3 ratio and all that can drive the production of some of those, uh, especially some of the inflammatory ones. So um, for your eicosanoids, uh, Echosanoids, arachidonic acid is the building block of these guys. Um, and if there's an overabundance of arachidonic acid, you can, it can increase inflammatory response, increases vasoconstriction, which would then raise blood pressure and it can induce labor. Um, it activates platelet aggregation and thrombosis, which can give you clots and blood clots. So high blood pressure, potential heart attacks, right? And all that kind of stuff. And again, these come, the excess arachidonic acid comes from excess omega-6 fatty acids, which are found in vegetable oils like canola or corn oil. Um, you should really actually limit those severely, if not cut them out completely. They're entirely too, pre too prevalent in our diet. And we have way, too, way too much of them in our diet, which means they are highly inflammatory, which is why we see a lot of inflammatory chronic diseases, uh, so just for example, diabetes, diabetes is related to this, but uh, a lot of the autoimmune diseases and stuff too. Um, so DGLA or dihomogamalinolenic acid uh, inhibits gastric secretions, uh, increases vasodilation and decreases the inflammatory responses. So DGLA is something that we want more of and it inhibits platelet aggregation and thrombosis. So it has all the opposite effects of arachidonic acid. So again, uh, where can these come from? Uh, so again, we have here borage oil, evening primrose oil, blackcurrant oil can bring some linoleic acid, um, and then it can be converted through these different processes to GLA and then DGLA, which is what we want. So primrose, primrose oil is good, blackcurrant oil, and all of that. And then, but from there, DGLA can either go to arachidonic acid or a PG, um, prostaglandin E1 or thromboxane. Um, Cyclooxygenase oxygenase uh, is going to convert DGLA here into uh, prostaglandins and thromboxanes. And um, cyclooxygenase oxygenase uh, is the target of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory molecules uh, and drugs such as uh, ibuprofen and stuff like naproxen and aspirin and things like they block this conversion here. So you don't get the prostaglandin or the thromboxanes and stuff or the leukotrienes um, and stuff. Um, so uh, arachidonic acid. Also, there's the uh, five lipo lipoxygenase um, and these make a different type of prostaglandins and thromboxanes. But uh, just think of all of these as driving inflammation. 
Um, and so, again, if you have an abundance of arachidonic acid, it tends to drive inflammation. So, all right. Um, diet and fats. So, uh, proteins release glucagon, resulting in less arachidonic acid. So, proteins are good. Uh, carbohydrates release insulin, resulting in more arachidonic acid. So, that is how excess sugar and excess carbs and stuff can be inflammatory because more arachidonic acid it pulls more inflammation uh and then the less arachidonic acid then results in a more favorable eicosanoid profile with more dgla and all that that are anti-inflammatory and again diseases especially chronic diseases can occur if arachidonic acid is predominant and uh, i have these little guys you're like why the heck does she have cows on this so um this is actually a plug-in um if you can at all buy, I've started at least buying my hamburger meat that's organic grass fed. So grass fed cows have a really good omega-6, omega-3 uh, ratio profile. So their, their, um, their sixes are lower um, in, uh, with, in with the three. So I think it's a, more like a six to one ratio, six omega-6 to one um, omega-3, which is a good ratio. Um, CAFO beef, so beef that on con confined animal feeding operations, so they're not grass fed, they're just corn fed and they're locked into, you know, cages and stuff like that. And, um, those guys have high omega-6 to, uh, omega-3. So their ratio is like 20 to one. So that meat's more inflammatory to you. Um, so if you can ever, you know, if you can afford it, if you can switch to grass fed, uh, organic beef, it is so much better for you. Uh, it is way less inflammatory. So let's talk a little bit of uh, about the, the micronutrients. So micro means small amounts, small, micro, small. So we need small amounts, um, so, but we need them. You cannot neglect these. Uh, and if you're missing some of those, you can have, it can drive a lot of different problems and diseases um, because they have roles all over your body. Uh, and so many physiologic reactions um, that if you're if you're missing, there are so many different reactions that can go wrong. So, for example, even let's just take like vitamin A, the top one there. Well, it's necessary for vision. If you don't have enough, you can develop night blindness. But it's also necessary for a proper functioning immune system. So you can have also more infections and stuff like that. So um, and it maintains a good intestinal barrier. Um, so there's not having enough can, can affect multiple functions. And it's the same for absolutely all of the vitamins and minerals. Um, and so uh, you have your vitamins and your minerals uh, in trace metals. And so we're going to look at some of those uh, here in just a minute. And um, again, you need us, I would say because of the way um, we farm and grow food and all that, our, our food doesn't have as much as it used to, and everybody could benefit from just taking a multivitamin on a daily basis. Okay, so um, Marlo is our case. She's 40 years old and has been experiencing bouts of fatigue and depression. Her physician also diagnoses osteomalacia. She lives on the coast of the Pacific Northwest where there are more than 200 cloudy and rainy days a year. So very cloudy, very rainy, not a lot of sunshine. Physician ordered a CMP and a phosphorus level, and everything is in normal limits. Um, so what should he order next? So obviously, we're in nutrition, so it's going to be nutrition-related, right? And what would the expected results be, and how would Marlowe be treated? So those are all questions you're going to answer in your Nearpod. Uh, and we're going to, as we cover the vitamins, I will help you guys figure out what's going on here. Okay, so let's talk about vitamins A and E. So... Uh, vitamin A contains retinol, and so uh, retinol is um, the, the what's transported in the blood. It has to actually be made to retinoic acid to be active, but uh, retinol is vitamin A. Uh, deficiency of vitamin A results in uh, de degenerative changes in the eyes and in the skin. Um, so, and also again, the immune system, uh, intestinal barrier function, and all of that. Um, they are found in um, Vegetables that are orange, so your carrots and sweet potatoes and stuff like that. Uh, vitamin E is a potent antioxidant. Uh, it is also known as tocopherol. And deficiency can lead to irritability, edema, and hemolytic anemia. And you find a lot of vitamin E in your nuts and seeds. 
Um, don't rely on like foods that have been fortified. So you may have, you know, a sugar sweetened cereal that has been refortified with vitamins. They put the cheapest, crappiest vitamins in there just to say they're in there. Uh, you need to find yourself a good quality multivitamin if you want to see good effects from it. So we can assess vitamin A and E. Uh, often they're done together. They are both fat soluble vitamins. Um, and so high performance liquid chromatography is usually the method of choice for both vitamin uh, and they're um, usually sent to a reference laboratory. Um, and it is important to uh, protect the specimen from light because light can uh, affect those levels, cause them to, to be falsely decreased. Um, vitamin D maintains calcium and phosphate concentration and uh, and deficiency obviously can lead to impaired bone formation, especially if you have a deficiency during the growing years. Um, and the lab methods for vitamin D um, assessment, so you have the 25-hydroxy vitamin D uh, test has, is the most common in many clinical labs. There's a bunch of different immunoassays available, um, but again, the immunoassays can only measure total vitamin D. You are, it is likely because this has become more popular in testing that your uh, regular hospital clinical lab might have vitamin D testing, um, you know, functions or they may send them out. Um, but if you want to measure the individual components of vitamin D, like D2 and D3, you have to use uh, liquid chromatography um, tandem mass spec uh, methodology there to do those. So obviously those would be a re reference lab test. Um, 125-hydroxy vitamin D is not routinely done. That is the active form of vitamin D. Um, it's usually done by endocrinologists and nephrologists. So usually you want a 25 or H vitamin D. Now, um, vitamin D, again, strongly associated with calcium and phosphate concentration. But did you know that vitamin D, if you have low levels, also functions in immune system? So having uh, low vitamin D makes you more prevalent uh, to have infections and be sick all the time. Uh, it is correlated with um, allergies and asthma, uh, higher incidences of allergies and asthma, uh, depression. So it's the sunshine vitamin. So uh, you see higher rates of depression in the wintertime when everybody's locked inside. You can't get enough uh, vitamin D. It's actually, um, yeah, so it's related to lack of sunshine, but really actually lack of vitamin D. How do you make up for it? You can simply supplement. So our case, uh, Marlo, she, she lives somewhere where there's not a lot of sunshine and stuff, and she's depressed and she's sick and stuff. And so the physician should absolutely check her vitamin D levels. And you can't make it more sunny in that area. So uh, more than likely what would happen with her is she would have to be on a supplement uh, probably, probably year-round. Okay, so vitamin K uh, is required for the production of certain coagulation factors uh, that are needed for clotting, obviously, uh, and is produced by bacteria in the intestines. So our friendly intestinal E. coli residents are who makes this vitamin K from, for us. So uh, this is part of the symbiotic relationship we have with our uh, microflora here. And uh, your dietary sources are green veggies and dairy. Um, and so basically the E. coli really likes the green veggies and dairy to turn him into vitamin K and stuff. Deficiencies are rare, but can be seen with overuse of antibiotics. So um, somebody that's constantly running to the doctor for um, antibiotics for sinus infections and stuff like that could, you know, or they're on maybe around the clock antibiotic use because um, they've had chemo and all of that. You could you know, potentially see vitamin K deficiencies and all that. So um, the assay is commonly ordered when attempting to discover the source of a bleeding episode. Um, and vitamin K levels can be performed in reference labs. And um, again, they're ordered when the vitamin K dependent clotting factors are normal and the patient is exhibiting a uh, uh, bleeding tendency. So you have enough of the, of the factors, so the factors are present, but Something's not working right, so maybe it's vitamin K that's missing. Okay, so let's do the B vitamin complex. Um, so uh, the B vitamin is the first of all water-soluble vitamins. So A, E, D, and K that we did were all our fat-soluble vitamins. 
So uh, now we're into our water-soluble ones. So your um, B vitamin complex, we have uh, B7, which is also known as vitamin H, um, and um, known as biotin, and it is used in fatty acid synthesis. We have B1, also known as thiamine, uh, is needed for uh, acyl-CoA synthesis in the Krebs cycle, and the deficiency is known as beriberi. Vitamin B2 is riboflavin, uh, used for redox reactions. B6 is peroxidine, uh, used for amino acid synthesis and conversion. Niacin is, again, a water-soluble B vitamin B3, uh, and is used for NAD and NADP production, which is uh, used in so many of metabolic reactions. The deficiency in niacin is known as pellagra. In the lab methods, they are all performed primarily by a reference lab, um, high-performance liquid chromatography and um, liquid chromatography tandem mass spec. Uh, all of them require that the specimen be protected from light. And again, uh, vitamin testing has become a really important part of preoperative workup um, for gastric bypass and then even monitoring afterwards because um, people that have gastric bypass surgery can have problems with vitamin deficiencies. So B12 and folic acid. So B12 is also known as cyanocobalamin. Um, it is necessary for amino acid metabolism and DNA metabolism. Um, and uh, deficiency in B12 can give you a megaloblastic anemia um, because you have fewer cell divisions, so uh, like a pernicious anemia. Uh, and pernicious anemia is actually an autoimmune disease where you have no intrinsic factor. You need intrinsic factor to be able to absorb B12. And so if intrinsic factor is not present, you cannot absorb B12. So um, on that, if you if you if you give the patient a supplement that to take orally, it's not going to do anything because the intrinsic factor is not there to allow the absorption of the B12. And so you would need B12 shots. Now, B12 uh, is present in a lot of uh, meat, dairy and fish and eggs and stuff like that, which if most people eat a uh, normal diet should get plenty of it. But if you are vegan, you are at risk of not having enough B12 because you don't eat any of the products that are listed, that are shown here in the picture. So in this picture right here. Okay, folic acid uh, needed for the synthesis of DNA and RNA. Um, again, if you don't have enough, you can have a megaloblastic anemia. Um, for the same reason because you're not making the DNA and RNA enough, uh, and you can get neurological symptoms, numbness and tingling, memory loss, and even psychosis. Um, and a vitamin B12 deficiency can lead to a folic acid deficiency. So folic acid was named after it because it caused foliage, so foliage or leaves. So all your green leafy vegetables have plenty of folic acid and also uh, melons and like oranges and stuff like that. So um, and you need folic acid uh, if you're thinking about having babies or going to get pregnant and stuff like that because you need it for your baby's uh, neurosystem, so his brain and nerves and all that to develop properly and not having enough can cause all kinds of problems. All right, vitamin C, also known as ascorbic acid. It is a cofactor for the synthesis of hormones, bile acids, and folate metabolism. So cofactor means it uh, helps the enzymes work, right? It's a powerful, water-soluble antioxidant. Um, and deficiency of vitamin C is known as scurvy. Um, related scurvy comes from ascorbic acid, so not having enough of the ascorbic acid. Anyway, uh, or ascorbic acid comes from scurvy, actually. Um, so again, scurvy, ascorbic, whatever. Uh, lab methods, vitamin C specimens have to be also protected from light. So you might as well just all your vitamins just protect them from light. And they're also liquid chrom chromatography tandem mass spec is the reference um, lab uh, method of choice. And uh, vitamin C is present in all of your citrus fruits in a great abundance, but in a lot of fruits and vegetables have vitamin C. Um, and so uh, interestingly, vitamin C can be Really, uh, if you're under the weather, if you have some kind of viral infections and stuff, vitamin C is actually really good, or even bacterial infection, uh, it's good to take to help um, your body get rid of it. Trace elements. So um, here are a few of them. So we have chromium. Chromium enhances the action of insulin, so uh, it can help with blood glucose um, regulation and stuff like that. So your diabetic patients should probably be on a chromium supplement. Uh, 
Copper involves many functions. It is carried by cerebral plasmin, and um, if you have a um, defect in copper metabolism problems, you can get Menken's disease or Wilson's disease. In Wilson's disease, you have accumulation of copper because you don't have enough of the cerebral plasmin to carry it. Um, manganese is part of several metal enzymes. So, by the way, so this is chromium right here. This is copper. This is manganese. This is selenium. Uh, selenium works with vitamin E. Selenium is also very important in uh, thyroid function. And then zinc, uh, the last one here, it has a key role in growth, wound healing, and regulation of hormones. And for you guys, uh, especially in uh, testosterone production. So how do we measure trace metals? So this is the uh, one thing that you use this dark blue, royal blue um, tube, purple, um, so dark blue top tube. Um, and so this is for so trace metals. So um, they can be performed on random urine specimens, 24 hour urine specimens, serum, plasma, and whole blood. And some trace elements are measured in red cells. Again, if you're drawing blood, you're drawing this dark blue tube. Um, all specimens for trace metal must be collected in containers that are designed for this testing and you cannot use it for anything else. Uh, for urine, the container, you need to uh, use an acid wash container or a metal free container. And for serum plasma and blood, uh, the trace metal tube. Uh, and so there's there are several different types. Uh, there's serum, there's EDTA trace metal and sodium heparin trace metal. And it will say on the tube, it's usually going to this dark. Uh, there's a dark green in it, uh, for the sodium heparin and then this dark blue one uh, is usually what you're looking for. Your methodologies can vary for the different trace uh, metals, but they usually include atomic absorption spectroscopy, so AAS, and then inductively coupled mass spec or SCPMS. Those are the two. And of course, they're usually done by reference labs. All right, let's talk a little bit about obesity and metabolic syndrome. So obesity is excess body fat and it has, there's a lot of potential health risk. It really puts you at risk for all the chronic diseases uh, and the cancers and autoimmune diseases and diabetes and all that kind of stuff. Um, metabolic syndrome uh, is a, a cluster, if you will, of symptoms that all go together and it's you know, usually diagnosed by lab results. So uh, other than actually um, an increased waist size, and high blood pressure in the lab with metabolic syndrome, you see the high triglycerides, uh, high cholesterol, low HDL, uh, and uh, elevated fasting glucose. Um, and so usually also, again, with that high blood pressure, uh, high abdominal size, so high waist size, um, and usually insulin resistance, high insulin levels and stuff. So metabolic syndrome is actually a cluster of conditions that increase the risk of heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. It is possible that the syndrome is linked to insulin resistance. It most definitely is linked to insulin resistance, which raises your triglyceride levels and other blood fat levels. And of course, um, you know, if you have insulin resistance, you're gonna have high fasting glucose. Uh, and it also interferes with the kidneys and leads to higher blood pressure because of um, water retention and stuff. So not a good thing. So some of the the mechanisms here. So um, so because um, well, let's just talk with just excess calorie intake and decreased energy expenditure. So you're eating too much, not doing enough. Um, things that can play into it are your age, um, ethnicity, gender, and all that kinds of stuff. There's all kinds of variables can play into that. Okay. Uh, and so that leads to weight gain and obesity. And again, excess calories, calorie intake, this can be driven by, uh, packaged foods and processed food because they are made for you to overconsume. They're designed for overconsumption. Sorry. I'm going to pick that up here in a minute. Um, so um, in obesity, you have an increased size and number of your fat cells of your adipocytes, which then increases your leptin. Remember, we talked about leptin, right? Uh, and which could lead to leptin uh, sensitivity. Uh, your, uh, it decreases adiponectin and other things, increases lipolysis and increases uh, some of these inflammatory markers, tumor necrosis uh, factor alpha and interleukin-6. 
Uh, in the pancreas, it will increase insulin secretion and decrease beta cell function. In the muscle, it will increase insulin resistance and decrease glucose uptake and increase inflammation, cause inflammation. In the blood vessels, you get endothelial dysfunction. This is where you get plaque buildup. Uh, and you get platelet aggregation, inflammation, and all of that. Uh, and then in the liver, you will also get insulin resistance with all of these um, um, gluco, uh, glycogenolysis and all of that comes increased, all of that. So this will all raise your blood sugar. And then in the stomach, you will have the increased ghrelin, which remember, it will make you hungrier, make you want to eat more and uh, decrease some of these, but which then increases appetite, which is driven by the hypothalamus, which then will make you eat more and stuff. And uh, so there's this vicious cycle. And then all of this leads to uh, being a high risk of cancers, uh, sleep apnea, asthma, uh, exercise intolerance, um, you know, atherosclerosis, hypertension, coronary artery disease, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, gallstones, osteoarthritis, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, all of these things. So anyway, definitely a growing problem in the U.S. Uh, that needs to be solved. Quartial core and marasmus are the opposites. So uh, quartial core involves low protein intake. Uh, this happens in regions of famine. Um, it's a maladaptive response to starvation. And the body uses ketones for energy, but then breaks down muscles and stuff to use protein. So... Um, in the lab results, you want to check uh, your glucose, electrolytes, hemoglobin, UA, OMP, and HIV. You will see hypoalbuminemia, hypoglycemia, low potassium, mag, uh, lipids, BUN, and iron. Um, and uh, you'll see iron deficiency, anemia, and metabolic acidosis. Uh, they tend to also have um, poofy face, uh, poofy hands, so edema on the face and hands, but are like really skinny arms and legs, but then a round uh, distended belly. Um, and marasmus is inadequate intake of protein and calories, and you have emaciation, so they're really um, skin and bones, and it is an adaptive response, and your lab values are normal. They're just really, really thin. So we're almost done. Inborn errors in metabolism. Let's uh, cover a few of them. So most are autosomal recessive. Uh, the mutation results in a blocked metabolic pathway because of a lack of an enzyme. And then you have an accumulation of the substrates. And then that accumulation could cause damage and problems and stuff. The clinical severity can vary uh, depending on you know, the different syndromes and stuff. Um, lab methods, uh, we look for the proteins instead of the genes. So we can lose, look at enzyme activity, the metabolites, and the protein structure. Uh, specimens are usually <clears throat> blood, urine, amniotic fluid, or spinal fluid. And the methods used are high-performance liquid chromatography, gas chromatography, mass spec, and tandem mass spec, and thin layer chromatography. The DNA tests are done only if the defective gene sequence is known for the disease. So if we can, if we know what to test for, basically, if we know the sequence and we know what to look for, then we can do DNA tests, which we know more and more of those. All right, so let's talk about the lipid defects and does uh, inborn error of, metab of metabolism. So the lipid defects all involve deficiency in enzymes that often results in neurologic disorders, so they affect the central nervous system brain and spinal cord and stuff. So uh, Tay-Sachs disease, your uh, gangliosides build up in the brain uh, tissues. It is a fatal lipid storage disease, so they don't get to live very long. Um, and basically, it leads to a destruction of the nerve cells uh, in the central nervous system, and they'll live about three to six months. Neiman Pick, uh, sphingomyelinase is what's uh, missing. It's an enzyme of fat uh, metabolism, and so um, the fat accumulates in the liver, spleen, bone marrow, and the brain. Uh, again, they don't get to live all that long. Gaucher, um, missing glucose cerebrosidase, um, and the fat builds up again in the spleen, in the liver, and in the bone. Um, and crab disease impairs growth of myelin, and so you get destruction of uh, the myelin before six months, and they're usually dead by two. And um, in HERLO, you have a buildup of glycosaminoglycans in the organs, and let me see, you have a skeletal abnormal 
abnormalities, cognitive impairment, heart disease, respiratory problems, enlarged liver, enlarged spleen, decreased life span, um, and they have a certain space anomaly that looks like they're squinting and their nose is up and stuff. Um, look up Hurler syndrome to have a very specific face, facial feature. Uh, so those are your lipid storage diseases. And then your amino acid ureas are phenyl ketonuria, tyrosinemia, homocystinuria, and maple syrup urine disease. And they're all part of the newborn screening test per portrayed right here. That's performed on all babies born in the United States uh, and is done by a tandem mass spectrometry. Uh, PKU, phenyl ketonuria, impairs brain development and you can uh, manage it with diet modification. Tyrosinemia, um, you will see failure to thrive in developmental delays, and those in accumulation tyrosine. And alkaptonuria, the urine turns black because of hom homogenistic uh, acid, and that, plat that pigment can build up into the connective tissue and then cause uh, arthritis in uh, the young adults. And then in homocystinuria, you'll see myopia, so that's uh, nearsightedness, I believe, um, osteoporosis and developmental um, delays. And maple syrup urine disease, um, developmental delays, poor feeding, lethargy, and it can be managed with diet modification. And in cystinuria, uh, you see young kids with kidney stones, which you usually don't see kids with kidney stones. So there you go. And I believe that is your last slide. Yay. Good job. Thanks for hanging with me. And you guys have a wonderful day.